So we're going to talk today in my session this afternoon uh, about identity and about authentication. The uh, title of the session is uh, Who Are You? Um, and it's really about how you can supercharge authentication identity within .NET Nuke or within DNN. Uh, so for those who don't know me, um, I am a product manager at Auth0, specifically on our appliance product. Primarily, we are a SaaS company, but we also offer uh, our product in an on-premise as well as in private cloud environments. I was also co-founder of DNN Corp, uh, and you can reach me at uh, Joe Brinkman on Twitter or Joe Brinkman on LinkedIn. Uh, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges that I see in identity and then dive into how I think we can solve those challenges in a, in a more elegant way uh, within DNN. So if we look back, sort of go back to when DNN first started, 2002, 2003 timeframe, right? This was the traditional way we built web applications. We gave everybody a username, password, open uh, at, the, at the application level, right? And that was how we secured users. And actually, uh, this is reminiscent of where we were in the original DNN, because it wasn't really even a username, it was an email address, right? And the email address was your username. But, you know, we've evolved since then. Uh, and it was, it was a different time, right? We had a small handful, maybe a couple dozen sites that we routinely visited. And uh, we didn't, like it wasn't that difficult to deal with passwords and to deal with uh, remembering what our usernames were on all these different sites. Um, but that problem became more and more difficult over time. And to the point where if you go on Google now, you can actually see, now I don't do this at, at security conferences because they would faint, the whole room would be out, but um, for here, uh, you can see that people have gotten so creative now that they've got these templates so they can write all this stuff down on a piece of paper that they keep right next to the computer uh, at their desk, right? Uh, my wife, in fact, has one of these, uh, which is kind of funny. Uh, but uh, so at DNN, uh, we were a little more forward thinking than that. Uh, several years ago, uh, we created uh, a provider system for authentication. And what this allowed us to do was plug in uh, different types of authentication systems into DNN. And we built ones for Google and Windows and, and Twitter and Facebook, and we even had an ADFS uh, uh, version for a while that would give us uh, a Windows uh, security prompt. Um, and all of those were great. Uh, but how many people have experienced the uh, changing of Twitter's API or Google's API? And then the question is, uh, the DNN thing broke. What do I do now, right? Like all my users can't log in. What in the hell do I do, right? It's like, well, I'll file a ticket and a couple months later, after all my users have left my website and are no longer visiting me, uh, it'll get fixed and, and dealt with in a new release, right? Not really what you want to hear when, uh, when you're in the middle of a crisis because users can't log into your application. Now, fortunately, you know, Google and Twitter and Facebook were probably not what you were using for, for your primary authentication method. Uh, but if you were using ADFS and suddenly Microsoft changed something in ADFS, uh, you could end up in this situation. And in that case, it was much more dire, right? Um, the other thing is, is that as we've evolved, the security and the, the concepts that you have to know about and the things you have to protect against have increased, right? Some of these go way back, DDoS, uh, hashing and, and replay phishing. Some of these are, are fairly well known, uh, but as hackers have gotten more sophisticated, uh, you see things today like cred stuffing attacks and you see uh, uh, SSRF, uh, where they're, they're doing some interesting things with, with the uh, actual 
uh, login uh, itself. So that you're seeing some new types of attacks, but you're also seeing a lot of the old attacks. And the thing that's interesting to me is that, you know, we, we kind of brushed this under the carpet in, in DNN. You know, for a long time, Kahal and myself and others have worked on, on the security side in DNN, but it was sort of a part-time sideline thing that we did outside of the other code work and, and work that we did uh, on the platform, right? So it was never our primary focus. It was never the thing that we did all day, every day, uh, looking at, at some of the ways that people were trying to break into these sites. And that really has some widespread implications. If you think about some of the major attacks that have happened in just the last couple of years, right, and, and some of the catastrophic results uh, as a result of that, you look at like what happened to Sony and their brand as a result, and, and the number of people who were let go, including very high ups at Sony, uh, as a result of those breaches. You look at things like Ashley Madison, where it led to people even committing suicide over the, the fact that that vulnerability exposed uh, some of their mm, less than moral uh, ways. Uh, you go to things more recently like Equifax or the OPM hack, where not even your fingerprints are safe anymore, uh, much less your passwords or any other uh, information that you might have out there on the net, right? So this is a really important topic, and it's something that deserves uh, attention and focus and, and directed energy, because I can guarantee you that the people trying to break into your site are really, really focused. And if you're not equally focused, or you haven't engaged with someone who is equally focused, uh, then you leave yourself at risk. And so, one of the challenges we always have in the security area is how do we increase the security standing of our systems without making it so difficult that users look for ways to circumvent the uh, improved security that we've added to the system, right? And it's like this is something that for security researchers and people who are on the cutting edge of research, uh, uh, cutting edge of uh, identity today uh, struggle with, right? How can I make it more secure without making it more difficult? Because if you make it too difficult, someone posts a sticky note or they go back to that username password uh, on the list next to their, next to their table. One of, the, one of the things, and, and just a little anecdote about this, one of the things that uh, a lot of companies have been doing over the last oh, five to, to 10 years is implementing something called multi-factor authentication, right? Where you type in your username password and a couple seconds later you get a ding on your phone or on, on some other device that says, hey, you know, someone's trying to authenticate, do you want to allow this, yes or no? Or maybe it, it asks you, well, what's the code that you have? And you have to pull out your phone and look up the code that changes every 30 seconds or 60 seconds, right? And so you go through this dance with multi-factor authentication. Um, my company recently looked at, like, we require multi-factor authentication to log in to many of our systems. And we looked across our, our user base, and what we saw was something on the order of about 17% of our customer base, who we consider to be pretty in tune with security best practices today, only 17% of them were using multi-factor authentication. Uh, even within our own company, you know, we struggle to make sure that all of our employees are using multi-factor authentication. Because at the end of the day, every time you add another layer of security and make it harder, people will try to find ways to circumvent that to simplify their life. So, what I'm going to talk about and show you a little bit is how Auth0 can actually solve a lot of these problems uh, in the DNN space. This is not to say that everyone should adopt Auth0, I hope you do, but what it is is to give you an idea of some of the alternatives that are available out there. Uh, and, and as part of the demo, I built 
an Auth0 provider. So using the same plugin system that we use today in DNN, uh, we can add Auth0 in. Uh, and the thing that I like about this, and the, and the reason why I did this, um, is because at Auth0, we have somewhere, and the number keeps changing every day because we keep hiring, uh, somewhere on the order of about 150 engineers, uh, architects, security personnel, uh, just in our engineering and security groups, uh, who are working nonstop on solving all of these problems, on counteracting all of the stuff that the bad guys are doing to try to break into your systems and everyone else's systems. Uh, so we have people like Mozilla and Atlassian and many others uh, who use our systems uh, because they trust what Auth0 is doing. So what I want to do today is, is sort of dive into some code and look what that looks like from a provider level uh, and, and see what we can do to increase the security level within DNN. Okay, so I'm going to jump over here to uh, our nice DNN website. Uh, and we'll just go ahead and log in here. And I'm going to log in first as a uh, as a super user. And we'll go ahead and log in. Now notice one of the things I did here, and this is something that was a pet peeve of mine for a long time, is I turned pop-ups off in this site, right? We should not be loading a username and a password in in this login screen on anything other than HTTPS, uh, which also means it shouldn't be in an iframe. Uh, it should be on your primary page. Uh, now, in this case, it's my local site, so I haven't, I haven't enabled HTTPS here, but uh, normally on a production site, that would be HTTPS. I would have my, my certs installed. And you can get certs for free today, right? So there's no excuse today for someone not having a cert for their website and running in an HTTPS. So we're logged in uh, in DNN, and we can go down to our extensions. Now, I've pre-installed this and been mucking around with it for a couple of days, so uh, we're going to bypass a lot of the steps. But you can see uh, I, could, brr, I could go through and uh, hit Facebook or Google, and I could install each of those, right? And I'll get a little bit. Uh, different experience. I'll get a button that, that lights up in the UI. Uh, but instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable uh, this, this one for Auth0, right? It's the same sort of authentication provider. Uh, now, one caveat that I'm going to give you today. Uh, this is available up on GitHub, and I'll, I'll show the link at the end of the talk today. This is not production code yet. Uh, I hope to get it to production code very soon, uh, send it through our security team to do a security analysis to make sure that anything I'm putting out there and telling you to use in production is actually ready for production. So please don't use this in production yet. It, it is open source. Uh, I, I'm more than happy to take contributions from community, uh, but I do want to get it through normal security review and all of that. Uh, before people start using it in production. So I'm, I'm just warning you now. I know there are some areas in here where I don't have all the, the error handling and stuff, but for purposes for the demo, I think it, it shows well. Um, so a couple things. I'm just going to come in and enable this, uh, and we'll go ahead and update those settings. Um, wow, that's a UI bug for DNN. Awesome. Um, yeah, let's see if that uh, actually saved. I'm not certain that that did, but we'll be able to tell here in a second. OK, good. So all this did is add another screen, another plugin. And we'll, we're going to go look at the code here in a second. Um, and what this does is it's going to use uh, OAuth 2, um, actually OIDC, to go in connect to uh, uh, Auth0 and bring up a, a different login prompt, right? And you're saying, what's the big deal? It's ignore Twitter for a minute. I meant to back that out. Um, it's uh, just a username and password, and we can already do that in DNN. And, and if all you were going to do was username and password 
um, then I would tell you probably just stick with DNN today. It's, it's fairly solid, but you know, things can change. Um, but if you wanted to get more secure, uh, let's talk about how we would do that and, and what that means in the context of Auth0 and why I think this is a great product for, for people in the DNN space. So we're going to go back here. No, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to go back. Um, and then let's shift over here. And let's go to, now this is my Auth0 dashboard. I'm already logged in. One of the things about Auth0 that I like is that once I have an account, I can actually set up multiple tenants here. Uh, and I can have different applications or different groups of users that I set up. Uh, and so I can connect my application to whatever group uh, we want. So I'm going to stick with the Auth0 DNN one that I've already got set up. Uh, and when I come in, I'm going to go to my applications. And here I'll see a list of applications. So imagine in a production system, you might have a, a web application that's logging in. You might have a desktop application or a phone application that are all logging in using the same user database, if you will, or sets of databases, as we'll see in a second. Um, and all of them can authenticate against the same uh, database. And because they're different types of systems, we use slightly different flows in the OAuth world or in the, in the uh, uh, OpenID Connect world, the OIDC, which is a, another sort of protocol or layer that sits on top of, of OAuth 2. Um, or even, as we'll see, uh, you can do things like SAML and ADFS and all of that, right? Uh, so, but for our purposes, I've set up this thing called uh, DNN Demo, uh, and it's going to give me, when I set one of these up, I'm going to get this domain, and, and if you guys can't read this in the back, let me see if I can actually zoom in on this a little bit here. There we go. Is that better? Okay. So we're going to get a domain, and that's a domain that's unique to me. Uh, we actually, you can use custom domains as well. Uh, it's going to, this domain is the primary domain. Custom domains is another custom setting that we can set up later. Uh, but for purposes of this demo, that's all we really care about. Uh, and then a client ID and a client secret. Now, all of these correspond uh, to the settings that we had in the provider over on the DNN side. And so all of those are pieces uh, of information that you, you need. And if you logged in or configured the uh, Twitter or Google or Microsoft or, or Facebook accounts before, uh, these would look very, very familiar to you. Uh, in those cases, you normally just use a client ID and a client secret. Uh, we use the domain because every application, every website is going to have its own domain because it's going to have its own set of users, right? So where, where I think that Auth0 really starts to add a lot of value and why I built a provider for it and why I think that provider is a great addition to the community is because of this thing we call connections. Now, out of the box, uh, we come pre-configured with a username, password, data store uh, in, in the system. So if you were starting up a whole new application and you needed to get username and password up real quick, uh, this would be the way that I would say to do it. Uh, but not for DNN, because we already have that. Uh, there's no reason to, to throw that out. Where it becomes really valuable uh, for uh, DNN is the ability to come in and set up over 40 different social uh, logins. Things like AOL, Salesforce, Yahoo, uh, Amazon, Box, Dropbox, 37 Signals. If you're in China, Baidu, uh, WeChat, I think I saw on there. Um, so there's a lot of different options you have for connecting through OAuth. Yes, Ash? Uh, if DNN ever provides a, a, an OAuth endpoint, then yes. Uh, but, but it would have to be an OAuth server endpoint 
uh, that can handle the, the OAuth 2 flows. Uh, so we can go ahead and turn a bunch of these on. Now, in the, um, in the environment that I'm in today, Auth0 has dev keys that it will use for these, but, and we're going to use those for today. But before I go to production, I would go ahead and get my API key and, and client secret uh, from each of these. And I'm just going to turn a bunch of these on at the moment. I'll we'll turn three or four on. And one of the things that, that I've been skipping past here is when we go in and, and connect that up to our application. Uh, all of these have uh, these things called attributes or, um, or you might think of them as scopes within the context of OAuth or security. And basically they say what pieces of data, what information can, can, these, can someone using this connector get access to? So if you think about when you go, when someone says, hey, I'm going to authenticate with Twitter, uh, some application, and you say, yeah, I want to I wanna use Twitter, I want to use Facebook to log in somewhere, usually in that flow, there will be a screen that pops up that says, hey, this app wants to access your Twitter account, and it wants access to these pieces of information, and it wants the ability to do these things, right? Those are what we call scopes. Uh, and this is just a, a, a nicer way of uh, showing those to you and saying, hey, these are the, these are the attributes that, that we are going to give your application access to. And we're primarily, at this point, just focused on identity. So we've enabled a couple of these here. What I want to do is come back over to my DNN site, right? And we'll go ahead and log in now. We'll bring up that login prompt. And now we can see that we're light, starting to light stuff up in my login prompt. Now one of the things that's nice about this is it means that I can set up a login and if I ever need to, like, if something happens with one of these and I no longer want to enable that scenario, I can just turn it off and know that, right, it's, it's a one minute exercise to turn off that access through Windows or Yahoo or whatever, uh, and then uh, your site is still up and running with, with the other thing. The other thing that's nice about the fact that, that we have all of these is that we also have engineers that are supporting all of these, right? So if you have a problem, uh, the engineers are, are most likely uh, going to notice it at the same time you do and spring into action to, to correct the problem, right? This is a production system, so we have production staff uh, working to make sure that all of these stay working because we have billions of logins that happen every day using all of these uh, various providers. Okay, so let's go and look at what one of these looks like when we go ahead and log in. And I may actually not see the full login because I don't know, I don't remember which systems I've logged out of and which ones I haven't. Um, but we'll try uh, LinkedIn here. Uh, and I may have to go back over here and get a password real quick. Uh, let's see if... Uh, yeah, now we get to play the... Remember my long password. Yes, yes, they, they uh, watched all of my keystrokes in there. And yes, we'll copy that over. And we'll come back over, paste that in. We'll go ahead and sign in here. Uh, and if everything went well, then we should come back over. And, and there was another step in there that I normally would have seen, but because I've been logging in and logging out, I've already gone through that confirmation screen. Uh, normally, when a user is doing this for the first time, they would be going through that intermediate step. And what you see is that when I came back over, I'm now logged in. Uh, one of the things, and this is probably something that I would, I would uh, come in later and in that, in that uh, provider would add another feature to be able to turn off or turn on uh, automatic uh, user registration. In this case, 
there was also some emails that went out um, that said, uh, you know, these are standard DNN emails that went out and said, hey, welcome to DNN, here's your new account. Uh, one thing that's interesting to note here, uh, let's see if we can get that, um, is if you look, we get this really funky, long, weird username that came across, and that's basically the identifier that uh, LinkedIn has for us. So on LinkedIn, I'm known as D8TN7 and a bunch of other characters, right? So uh, that's what it looks like when the information's coming across from, from LinkedIn. So the other nice thing is, is that all of those, because I'm asking for certain pieces of information to come back, um, I'm also getting profile data uh, that's coming back across for me. So let's stop here. We're going to do, do some more. Uh, we're going to stop here for a minute and take a look at some code because I, the thing that's important to me is not so much all of the stuff that happens on Auth0 side because, you know, well, that's important, but I, you know, for purposes of this uh, uh, talk today, I want to talk a little bit about what, what the code is like in order to make this happen. And there's really four steps uh, four primary steps that happen in a login, and it, and it doesn't matter whether it's, whether it's a login with Auth0 or it's any other uh, OAuth-based login, right? Very first thing we're going to do is we're going to authorize. And so when I click that login button, I'm going to actually go out and do a redirect. Uh, so we'll go ahead and jump through the code here. Uh, we'll do a redirect, and you'll see the code is not really that uh, complex. We've got a couple of pieces of information that we use to build a URL, right? What was the, uh, am I in the right spot? Yeah. Uh, this says I want to get a, a, a code come back from the OAuth uh, server, and I'm going to pass in that client ID, and I'm going to pass in where we want the server to come back to, and I'm going to pass in a scope. And that scope is one that I've predefined that says I want the open ID uh, profile information, I want the standard profile information, and because of the way the OAuth spec is and the OIDC spec, I also have to specify that I want email to come back if it's available. Now, these are the things I'm asking for. The thing to remember with OAuth is just because I've asked for it in a scope, I'm dealing with potentially dozens of different OAuth providers. Not all of them are going to honor each one of these scopes. So if I go to Twitter, Twitter's not going to give me an email back. I have to jump through a bunch of extra hoops for Twitter in order to be able to do that. But the code to make that first step, so this is only step one of four, is I build a URL with a couple of pieces of information and the SDK for Auth0 makes this real easy. Uh, and then I go ahead and I redirect uh, and I basically do a HTTP redirect over to that URL, right? So this is, this is that step of going from my website, we'll log out here, right? This is the step where I click the button and I've redirected over to this other site, right? So that's step one. Step two happens after I come back from this site. So once I've clicked here in my LinkedIn, and it should remember me from previously, right? Step two was I came back to the site, uh, and all of these step two through four happen sort of silently in the background. Um, and those uh, happen up here in async. So one, one uh, thing to note is that this code won't run today in any version of DNN 9, 2, and before. Uh, because one of, the, one of the items that I found as I was building this out is that DNN doesn't currently support asynchronous uh, calls inside the page lifecycle. Uh, 
as you start doing more and more uh, network uh, development, uh, making remote calls, you know that more and more APIs, remote APIs, are being, using asynchronous APIs, uh, and especially in the SDKs. So in this case, I was forced to use an asynchronous call, and to get that to work, you have to have a async equals true in the default.aspx, in the, in the actual page uh, tag itself. So I, I submitted a pull request to that earlier. I'll get with you afterwards, Ash, and show you, because I don't have a JIRA on it. I need to get a log in there again. Um, but anyway, so we're going to do some stuff asynchronously here. Uh, and the important thing is this have verification code, all it does is it looks at the URL that came back uh, when I redirected back from the login and said, did the server give me a code back, right? Because I asked for a code in that initial request and it gave me a code back. And that code basically says you can use this code to later request a token, right? So this is a normal flow in OAuth on the, when you're doing server-to-server -server calls. If I were doing a call, say, on the client side in a SPA application, uh, I would probably just do a token flow where I, where I skip this code, and I would go straight to getting a token back. Uh, it's a little bit different, and there are some reasons why uh, you would go with, with one flow or the other. Uh, but for our purposes, the correct flow is, is to use the code flow. So if I have that code, then I'm going to go ahead and exchange that code for a token. And again, the code here, because I'm using the SDK from Auth0, uh, is a single method call. Now, I've got this wrapped in a try-catch. Uh, this is part of the, the to-do, right? I've got some error handling I need to put in here, but this one line of code is effectively uh, where my call happens. And it calls that get token async. I pass in my client ID and my client secret from before. I pass in that code that I got back and I pass in the redirect URL, uh, which tells the system, hey, come back to the login page when you, when you make this call, right? Uh, and in this case, is just validating that I'm using the same redirect when I'm getting my token that I used when the system generated the code prior. So it's a check to prevent uh, some of the various attacks uh, that go on in the system and verifies that, hey, it's the same server, it's wanting to redirect to the same place, uh, everything will look good. So coming out of this, I am going to get a, a response uh, that has my token in it. It's going to give me a refresh token. It's going to tell me how long that token is good for. Uh, and basically, I'm going to be able to use that token to call then any subsequent APIs I want to call. And I can use that token later if I were using uh, this OAuth session to secure APIs in my application, I could actually use that token uh, for securing and calling those, those APIs as well. Uh, so I get a token back as long as that, that token response is not null. Um, we'll go ahead and assume that we're authorized. So now we've completed step two, which was exchange my code for my token. So now I know I'm a valid user. I know that uh, I've got a good token that I can use for making API calls, but DNN still doesn't know who I am. It doesn't know, you know that I'm Joe Brinkman logging in with LinkedIn. It just knows that somebody has logged in and that a token has been issued. Uh, step three is we need to go out to Auth0 one more time and say, here's my token. Give me all the user information, the profile and, and basic user info that you have for the person who logged in uh, under this credential represented by the token. Now, it's important to, to know that when we set up all of those things over on the Auth, 
on the auth zero side and we were saying what permissions or what what scopes what information did we want to make available um, this is where that becomes important because now this is where it's going to determine what information can I get from Twitter what information is Facebook going to give me back um, of, of the realm of information that it has uh, so that's in this uh, in this step right here which is get current user async and we'll step into that again I'm going to do this a little differently let's just zoom the code up there that's better right again just a couple lines of code uh, this is calling the the uh, auth0 API get user async there's a bunch of network uh, remote calls behind the scenes in the in the SDK but I've taken that access token that I had I give it back to the API and said here's my credentials that prove that I can do this and now it's going to give me back a user object okay and that user object is a is a basically OAuth uh, OIDC conformant user object that has all of the standard user information depending on what I've done with that object on the server side there may even be additional claims or additional uh, elements profile information uh, that can be tacked on there on the server side as well and I can examine all of those uh, if I wanted to on the on the DNN side so the final step after I make that that last call is finally to go in and tell DNN uh, now take this user information and this is the only place it gets complicated uh, because we're making a bunch of basically mapping from that OAuth uh, user object and mapping that back to all of the DNN profile and basically saying take all these fields from that user object map them into a DNN user uh, we'll, we'll attempt first to look up and see if, if that DNN user exists uh, and if he did I can just add that data into the current user uh, if that user didn't exist then I'll go ahead and create a new user uh, and that's where this auto register equals true this probably uh, should be maybe a, uh, a setting in the in the uh, provider for the purpose of this demo I just left it in here it's a line actually the the interesting thing is all of the Facebook uh, Twitter all the ones that we have today all the OAuth ones all this is code directly from them uh, so if you're using those today just know that they can auto register into your site um, and, but they still go through the normal uh, like if you've got verification turned on or if you're private whatever uh, all of those other checks that you have in DNN uh, in terms of public private accounts uh, still still matter it's just you could end up with uh, users that are registered that aren't aren't verified or aren't validated right um, so again the, the most complex part here is just getting through the DNN stuff and then at the very end so we attach that back to our profile and then we launch the normal unauthenticated DNN event which that is where the system will go back in and if that user didn't already exist it will go ahead and create that user add the profile stuff it'll handle all the normal DNN stuff and that's the entire uh, the entire uh, provider right there's not a lot to it there are a few places we might we might go in and add, do some tweaks to add some additional uh, configuration control one of the ones that we didn't talk about though was this thing called the connection um, and let's go in and look at that because that's that's kind of important especially when you're when you're dealing with scenarios like this where I have potentially multiple methods to authenticate um, I might have multiple different applications that are coming in using the same the same uh, user credentials the same what we call a tenant in, in the Auth0 world uh, 
and so when I want to say specify in DNN and, and maybe I only want people coming in and logging in with uh, with a specific type of account. Oh, let's not fat finger it. So I can come in, we'll log in, I'll go back, change some settings here. So one of the settings that we have is this thing called a connection. And I can actually specify and say, hey, don't, don't let them come in on just any connection for this DNN site. So imagine, if you will, I had three or four DNN sites that I wanted to be able to authenticate through this same user system, right? I wanted to do SSO, but I wanted to say, this site can only use Twitter or Facebook to log in, and this other one's going to use username and password or some other, maybe it's going to use uh, ADFS or something like that. But I still want them to be able to sort of share those, those common users and some of the common configuration in Auth0. Um, I could come in and set up, and we're going to go in, uh, and we're just going to say uh, that I only want LinkedIn available. And that connection name actually comes from uh, comes from the UI. It's right here. It says what the name is. Some of them, like Google, are a little funny. It's it's Google OAuth 2. It's not just Google, right? So they're a little more specific. But most of them are pretty straightforward. Um, so I'm going to say just let me use LinkedIn, uh, and instead of showing that intermediate step, right, that intermediate dialogue, uh, if I say, you know, let's log out here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually open up LinkedIn so this works properly. Uh, I'm going to force a log out on LinkedIn as well so that my account is not logged in. I will sign out here. That's good. And now when I log in, uh, and go through this link. Uh, it's going to go straight to LinkedIn, right? It's going to skip that intermediate dialogue because I've already told the system, hey, regardless of all the ones that are enabled, I want this application or this portal to use LinkedIn only, right? So I'm going to go to LinkedIn directly, uh, and then again. We'll go ahead and log in. And sign in. And my password is not still in my in my paste, so let's find that again. And let's go ahead and paste it. So 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 far everything we're showing is Assuming that's going to log in, I should be OK. OK, yeah, so I'm back in, right? So now we've shown the ability to use multiple providers uh, that, are, that are managed by a security and engineering team. Um, it keeps expanding all the time. And, and that's great and you know, awesome. We get, we get some more providers. And if that was all we were doing, I would say it's a good deal. There's some value there. Um, but maybe there could be more. Maybe there's something additional we could be doing, uh, you know. And we could do we could do something like you know, maybe we want to use Google Apps or ADFS or something like that uh, for login. Um, but what if we really like kicked it up a notch and said maybe we want to do something really crazy, like not require a password at all, maybe. We're going to go with an authentication system. Uh, we call it passwordless. Uh, it's got some different names in, in different companies. But effectively, I'm going to enable the ability for us to log in just with my email account. And I'm going to tell the system, hey, when, when I log in, when I give you this email address, I want you to email me a code back that I can then use to come into the system. right? And the thing that's interesting about that is, like, if I give you an email address and you mail me the code back and then I come into the system, that seems pretty cumbersome, right? It's going to take three, four, five seconds. 
But imagine the scenario, like this is something that you have with like Intuit and TurboTax and a lot of these systems, right? You use them one time a year, and then you won't use them again for another year, right? And it's like, and this is a classic case where people would create a password, create a username, and you saw companies like Intuit and many others where every year their biggest cost of doing business was the support side of all these people calling in saying, I don't remember my password. How do I get it reset, right? Um, for once a year login, uh, this is a great, uh, a great feature. Um, and this is just one of the ways that, that Auth0 is out there looking at alternatives and different ways that you can secure systems and different scenarios where you might want to use a, a different security mechanism. Now, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of another feature we have. Uh, today, I can't just enable that. I have to sort of change that, that login prompt and what that login prompt looks like. Uh, so I'm going to go into what we call our, our hosted pages, uh, and I'm going to change my template here. So this is our default template that just comes in, uh, has some JavaScript on the page for configuring it, and I can override that and change that to what I want. Uh, lock is just our, our JavaScript widget uh, that you could drop on any page to, to give you a login prompt. We host that for you in, in this scenario. Uh, and in this case, by changing to this other template, I'm going to use uh, our passwordless widget. And so what that's going to do, and I'm going to turn off all of these others, because I really just want to focus on this passwordless scenario. So let's come back here in my, to my application. I'm going to go into all my connections, and we're going to turn all these others off. I don't need username and password. Don't need Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, Twitter, or Windows Live. Um, we're just going to use the email uh, password list there. Okay? We'll come in on the DNN side. I'm going to quickly go back, remove that connection here. And we'll go ahead and log in, or we'll, we'll remove this connection name since we're not there yet. Okay, and we'll update, and that should be good to go. We'll log back out, log in, come in, Auth0, log in. Ah, uh, something went wrong. And let's make sure we've got email and hosted pages. Probably didn't save my hosted, probably didn't save my template change here. I didn't. This is auth zero lock. Um, template <coughs> lock. Make sure that's passwordless. Save that. Let's go back, and we'll log in again. Now, you've seen me a lot go to this login page and hit this thing. If I were, the other piece that I want to build out uh, for this provider is actually a change to the lock, or to the, to the login button, right? Because in many cases, I just want to go straight to this. I don't want to go to a login page and then hit another link to go to yet another login page. I want to be able to come directly here. And we can do that with a, with a skin object. Um, but so for this case, I'm going to go to joe at brinkman.me. We'll go ahead and submit. And then it's going to ask me for my code. Now, uh, if I come over here, let me check and see. We'll check my email real quick, and I should have gotten a new code. Welcome to DNN Demo uh, 2154. We'll copy that over, paste that code in, and go ahead and submit that. And now it's going to log me in. And one thing that's interesting, 
The only piece, the, the only identifier that I used to log in was my email address, right? So this is one of those scenarios that if you're going to use this on a website, you need to know what's the result in terms of what my profile looks like so that maybe I don't want to have a, a registration or a user thing up there displaying the user profile, right? Uh, because you don't want someone seeing my email address uh, just because I logged in there. So, uh, but yeah, so now I'm logged in just using an email address with passwordless. So that's pretty cool. Uh, that's something that we couldn't do before in DNN. Um, uh, but let's, uh, let's go a little bit further. Um, I think I've got time for one more bit of demo here. Um, and what I want to do, is, and we're going to leave the passwordless up and running because I think that's cool. Um, but I want to say, you know what, I only want passwordless, but I only want passwordless to run and to be enabled for people coming from a specific uh, email domain, right? Like I don't want to enable this for just anybody in the world to go sign up for Gmail, come in, create an account on my system, and boom, they're in, right? Maybe that's not the scenario I want to support. Um, one of the features that Auth0 has is this thing called rules. And rules are pretty cool in that I can create a rule, um, and we've got a bunch of pre-canned rules already, uh, and it's basically just JavaScript code, uh, node code specifically, that I'm going to be able to run in the context of the authentication uh, that can maybe provide some additional profile data. Maybe I'm going to go out to a third party, uh, a third party uh, marketing system to grab additional profile data. Maybe I'm going to look in one of my own uh, user databases. Maybe I, I look in my association membership list right, in some other system uh, and I'm going to pull based on that email address and pull in some other profile data about that person. right? Uh, in this case, what I want to do is I want to look, uh, I want to whitelist some users. Um, so I'm going to do email domain whitelist. And I'm just going to use um, a uh, brinkman.me as the whitelist, right? So this is the domain. This is not the full email address. So anyone coming in with a brinkman.me uh, account uh, should be fine. Anyone trying to log in with any other domain uh, is going to get an error. Um, so let's go back and, and test that. I'm going to make sure, did I save that? Yep. Uh, so that's saved. Um, and let's go ahead and log in again. This is where I'm saying I would, I would use that other link and skip that whole intermediate step. So let me try with my Auth0 uh, account first. And we'll go ahead and submit. And it's going to ask me for my code. Um, it should not have given me a code. So I've got some uh, issue here. Let me do this. Um, let me go into enable one of the other socials. Uh, we'll just enable uh, LinkedIn again for a minute. Yeah. So this may be something I'm thinking that it's not working with passwordless, and I haven't tested passwordless on that specific rule before. Uh, but anyway, it, uh, since I see other people starting to filter in, uh, you get the idea. The, the ability to run rules in the middle of the authentication now gives you much greater uh, five minutes. Awesome. Uh, now gives you much greater control over that login experience. And, and you can go wild with those rules. And in fact, uh, some of the things that people do with them is the ability to look at that incoming email. And maybe you want to link across multiple accounts. You see, hey, they've got the same email for Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, it's probably the same account. So regardless of which one they log in, it merges all those profiles and sends back one single profile 
for all three systems, right? So that's something we call account linking. Um, and there are a lot of other scenarios that you can use, uh, and when you, when you look at those rules, um, that's one of them. The other thing that you can enable, uh, and I don't have time to, to demo this today, is something called uh, multi-factor authentication. So not only can you have multi-factor on LinkedIn, Twitter, or whatever, uh, but you can actually enable it at the, the main system and say, hey, regardless of what those settings are, I want to enable multi-factor authentication. So regardless of which way a user logs in, I'm still going to challenge them for a second factor. Uh, so whether they're username and password or whatever, uh, I'm going to challenge them with a push notification or an email uh, with a code. Um, actually, email is API only. Uh, push notification or SMS, right? So I'll send them a text message with a code, or I'll do push notification, which goes out to an application like uh, Google, uh, or um, there's one called Duo. There's one that Auth0 off offers called Guardian. Uh, all of those allow me to get a notification, see that a person's trying to log in, I can just push a button on my phone, and then it goes back into the system and knows that person's been authenticated, let them in. Okay? Uh, so there's a lot more we could cover. Um, really don't have time to go into all of it, but I think you get the idea that there's a large world of identity out there uh, that DNN doesn't play in today. And there's a lot of security threats that are out there the DNN is not really set up and prepared to deal with today, but there are companies, whether it's Auth0 or others, we have competitors, uh, that will provide this level of security for you. Uh, Auth0, one last item, uh, and then I'll open it up if people have questions for a minute. Um, so the, uh, we do have a freemium model, so for people who want to log in or just take advantage of this, and use the free account, uh, that's great. Uh, we support up to 7,000 monthly active users. And what a monthly active user is, is somebody who's logged in one time in a given month. Uh, at, at several years ago, uh, not necessarily at our peak, but around the 2011-2012 timeframe, I know that on DNN.com or DNN software, whatever we were at the time, uh, we were doing about 10,000 monthly unique uh, logins, right? So e you can be a very large website and still fit comfortably under that 7,000 uh, monthly active user uh, number. So uh, I urge people to go take a look at the code. If you see things you want to help with, places we should put in some, some uh, additional uh, error handling, or some additional parameters we think should go in the settings. You know, I'm more than willing to take pull requests. Uh, I am going to put in a, a new skin object, though, to make to skip some of the DNN login uh, stuff, so we can go directly to the, the Auth0 login. Uh, with that, uh, if there are any questions about OAuth or any of the stuff that I showed here today, I'm happy to, to answer any questions, or you, if you see me out in the hallway, uh, you know, happy to do that as well. Yes, Hans. Yeah, uh, you showed the multiple uh, uh, social media IDs where I mm -hmm. uh, From a user perspective, uh, how do I remember which one I use for this specific site? If I can choose between Facebook and LinkedIn, and I yeah. choose the wrong one. Yeah. Um, I don't really have a good answer for you on that today. Um, you know, I'm sure there's a way that we could do uh, some additional things with rules, or we could do some additional things. That's part of why that registration, uh, that automatic registration might be problematic. But that's also a place where, and what I haven't put in the code here and what's not in our other uh, social login code is the ability to account, do account linking on the DNN side, uh, which we used to have um, in, in some of the older uh, login stuff, and that's the ability to say, hey, this user's actually coming in on, on an already known uh, email address, we should link those accounts. Um, is it, um, in your LinkedIn example, is it possible after a successful login to input some basic information from LinkedIn into DNN user profile? Yes, so 
uh, every one of these uh, providers or, or IDPs, um, uh, identifying parties, uh, will provide whatever profile data uh, that you request uh, when you're setting up that connection. Uh, and that's not something we control, that's something they control at their API level. Uh, different ones have different amount that they offer. Uh, but sometimes, like in that rule, uh, you can actually, and we've got an example for Twitter, but you can actually write a rule that maybe they don't provide it in the basic login bit, uh, but you can go back out and request through another API additional details, right? Or that's also a case where I've seen instances where there are rules that you can go out to the third party system and request additional profile data. Uh, so it makes it really nice when you're, when you're doing lead gen uh, and you've got forms up for lead gen and you've got username, password, whatever. Uh, for lead gen, you don't have to have 50 fields filled out. Uh, you have them fill out two or three and then you send that information off to a third party uh, marketing system and it'll pull back all the rest of the data that, that's known about that user. So uh, it's, it's very nice. Okay, with that, uh, we're done for today, and thanks everyone. Hopefully uh, you saw something there you, you liked.